2018. And thank you for the well wishers uh, for last week and when I when I became ill during the webinar. I appreciate all of those who reached out to me and, and wished me well. And I'm feeling much much better this evening. So I'm happy to get into it. For me, this broadcast really encapsulates an evolution in, in my thinking. It comes in part because of a response that I get from parents often when I, I spend a lot of time and energy talking about providing a, an adequate container for a child, right? Expanding yourself, uh, transformation in parenting, and, and really speaking to a kind of a core need that children have that, that they often don't get enough of, and that includes us, and that is to, to be seen and to be heard. The challenge becomes, of course, that when I say that, people often hear me suggesting or, or their interpretation of that you have to forget yourself in the process. And, and I kind of take that for granted, that, that a self in a parent is, is present. But what I've come to realize is that we all are children and we all have various levels of, of development in, in our own self. And so the first ingredient in helping raise a self and helping support a child and providing an adequate container, an adequate space and support for a child is the self of a parent. And so tonight I wanted to talk about the balance between those two ideas, between what it means to provide for a child and their needs, but also where we get our needs taken care of, how we take care of our needs, why it's important, essential that we take care of our needs. And I'll start off with the idea of selfless parenting. I was asked by Red Book Magazine a while ago to list things that I would encourage parents never to say. They asked for two, my top two, and I gave them 20. Um, but the first one that I put on the, the list, the one that came to mind, ended up being the first one on their list. And it's this phrase that, that parents say, and even probably think is an ideal to strive for, and that's the, the idea of, I do everything for you. And what I say about this is, first of all, it's just not true. Second, one of the most damaging things for a child is the unlived life of a parent. Lastly, if this were true, this leaves the child with no place to put their hurt or their anger. They think if mom and dad are selfless and do everything for me, then how can I be angry at them? The problem must be me. So not only is it not an ideal to strive for, not realistic, not even possible, but, but it creates a lot of fundamental problems with children. And so we have to take care of ourselves, first and foremost. And if we don't, then our children are going to become unlisted, enlisted unconsciously and are going to volunteer for the job of taking care of us. And most of the time that goes very poorly for everybody. It results in children acting out. It re results in depression, anxiety, rebellion, ironically, substance abuse, self-medication, a, a lot of other problems. So it's very important, again, that we practice self-care. It, it relieves a, a huge burden off of our children when we do that. Selfless parenting is an idea that some parents believe they are sworn to live by. A belief that says, I do everything for my child, their needs come first, and mine comes, comes second, or not at all. Though this kind of thinking may seem admirable, carrying it out is almost impossible, and it is likely not healthy for either one of you. And so again, this idea that, that we should strive for, it, can strive for, it, becomes harmful. And, and ultimately, it, it makes the child responsible to turn out a certain way to validate us, right? To take care of us emotionally. Oftentimes when I challenge this, especially with children in the field, this idea that it's not their job to take care of their children, take care of their parents. And I don't say it quite like that. But I say things like, your parents' serenity, peace of mind is not your responsibility. It's their responsibility. Them being proud of you, making them proud of you is not your job. And children will often look at me quizzically and, and sometimes challenge me and saying, nobody thinks that way. That's not the way that it is. I, I know that's my job. And for a, a large percentage of our clients and students, they come in here thinking that the job is to be good, to be obedient, to be right, and to resolve parental anxiety, worry. And while we all feel it, we all feel anxiety when our children are st struggling, that becomes our job to, to, to take care of, to be responsible for. That's why we talk about and preach self-care. That's why we talk about going to therapy, to Al-Anon. 
to go to places. I'm not saying don't feel anxious, don't feel worried. I'm saying make it your responsibility. But in order to do that, we oftentimes have to let go. We have to learn to tolerate guilt. It feels selfish to us. It feels counterintuitive. It seems to be going in the opposite. When you attempt to act as a selfless parent, you create an unhealthy dynamic in which you must get your needs met through your child. You're using your child rather than connecting with her. And you don't value yourself, then you don't value or model self-care and self-worth for your child. If you're a selfless parent, where's the space for your child to be angry with you, like I said before? A great deal of guilt can grow within a child if her parent needs if her, if her parent needs to be completely selfless. If, if you're a saint, right? If you're completely, completely selfless, then, and if they're causing you pain, discomfort, anxiety, worry, something must be wrong with them. How could they think any, anything else, right? A child, especially a young child, is not capable of, of differentiating and saying, that's my mom's stuff. That's my dad's stuff. Now, when, when loved ones express concern to you, when they, when they share with you their thoughts, it's valuable to look at yourself, to ask yourself questions, to see if it fits, right? That, that's part of what we do. But we don't take it on. We don't ask them to take it on. It's, it's, quite, a, it's quite a unique perspective at Evoke compared to most therapeutic programs in the field today. And, and, it, and it really... It, it, it goes away from symptom reduction. It goes away from pleasing the parents. It goes away from short-term gains, gains and, and really goes at the heart of developing a healthy sense of self in children. But again, first and foremost, that requires that the parent be working on that project in themselves also. This idea about over-identified, over-involved parenting. It breaks my heart to see him suffering. I'd do anything for him if it would help. There's nothing I wouldn't do for that boy. That kind of talk, and I've listed the, the podcast where I borrowed it from, that kind of talk in a parent is identified as, as threatening to a child's sense of self as criticism or angry and frustrated communication from a parent. In this podcast, it's, it's worth listening to. They go on to say, this kind of comment or even just that yearning, that hope for him to get better, as expressed through this tone, that desire to fix the problem, it oozes out of a person they have found and works to trigger relapse in the person they're thinking about. It's so odd because it sounds so like, compared to hostility or criticism, it sounds like you're just being a champion of that family member. The reason that we believe it is associated with, with relapse is because from the part of the patient, they're just feeling too monitored. They're feeling too causative. They can't breathe. They feel stifled, right? It's a threat. It activates the same part of the brain as hostile or critical comments from a parent. In, in psychoanalytic terms, we call it annihilation through consumption, right? You're kind of swallowing the ch child in this process. And we fantasize sometimes that over-identification or over-involvement is just kind of an exaggerated too much love. It, it's something entirely different than love. Love is a heroic task. Love is the courage to take on your own differentiation. Like Gandhi says, the quote that I often share with you, my favorite quote. A, a coward, he says, is incapable of, ex of exhibiting love. It's the prerogative of the brave. Projection, fusion, going home is easy. Loving another's otherness is heroic. And if we love other, he says, as other, we've heroically taken on the responsibility for our own individuation and our own journey. And this heroism may properly be called love. That's, that's why we ask you to do your work, not because you're the, the, the fault or the cause of the behavior, but because when you make that the project, when, when changing you becomes the project, it takes off such a burden in the child. They feel safer. They, they can't articulate it, but they feel safe. And then you have more capacity to be there for them instead of them being there for you, them needing to 
show up a certain way or be less symptomatic, right? So that you're, that you're okay, so that you can sleep and that you can eat. It is really counterintuitive. Providing for children is, uh, is heroic parenting, and heroic parenting is, is looking inward, right? That's the whole idea. I say to my family, to so my parents, parents that are willing to show up and do their work, it is heroic, it is rare, it is exceptional. And we have so many justifications for not doing it. Right? When we talk about it's not our fault, it's not our responsibility, we're not to blame. We don't need help. Look at our life, it's fine. It worked for me, it worked for the other children. But heroic parenting is having the courage to just look at yourself, work on yourself, without layering on lathering on shame and guilt you just do it because it's a better presentation because it's it's better living seeing hearing and containing the child and and also knowing your own limits it is okay to say this is my limit i can't go any farther i'm not comfortable with this you don't need to be omnipotent all powerful all capable if you knew if you, if you needed to be that your children will be doomed from the get-go. But what they need is they need you to make self-care your project. They need you to own it, to not make it about them. In psychology, there's this idea of the bad object, right? The bad object is there's a dilemma inside of me that I feel uncomfortable dealing with. And so I make somebody else the bad object, the cause of that anxiety, that dilemma. And our children are fantastic at fulfilling that role, right? Cutting, school refusal, depression, suicidality, self-medication, addiction, rebellion, aggression, sexual promiscuity, all of that stuff. They fill the role fantastically. And they become the bad object. But this work is to take it inside again and to say that my dilemma is mine. My child is another thing. And that's why when I do work, I'm in the middle of a, of, a, of a finding you, too, with a bunch of parents right now. And the amazing thing is they're realizing as they do their work, and they've realized it before, and they're, they're reconnecting to it now, that, that the work that they have to do has nothing to do with their children. And as one of them eloquently put this evening, it does when they do their work present, provide the, the best opportunity, the best chance at providing the child the, the, the necessary support in their life. doesn't guarantee its outcome, but it's your best foot forward, your best contribution. And, and, and coming just short of cause and effect. We, we learn to have new eyes and new ears through this process, right? We see our children differently. We, see, we don't see symptoms, we see pain. We don't see behaviors, we see wounds. We don't see diagno diagnoses, we see trauma and, and patterns of coping. We see something that makes sense. No matter how irrational it looks on its surface, we're able to see and hear it. And because we see and hear things differently, we're able to tolerate it in a much more calm, reflective, flexible way. There's a lot of transformation that goes into this process. In, in a sense, I'm hearing children say to parents, by, by, by what got them here? This isn't working for me. Right? Something is broken. I can't articulate it. I can't speak to it. I, I probably have too much shame to ask for it directly. But I don't even know what it is. But this isn't working. You know that old cliche, it's a cry for help? That's kind of what this thinking is. It's a more sophisticated version of that. And so the job becomes expansion, increasing capacity. But you can't do that without some trade-offs. You're going to have to go to an al on me. You're going to have to go to your own intensive. You're going to have to go to your own therapy. You're going to have to go on vacation. Whatever it is, you're going to have to feed yourself so that when you come back to the family, and you'll have to fight. By the way, 
you'll clearly have to fight the guilt that we often feel when we do those things. And the shame that, that prevents us from doing those things. But then in the end, we come back with more capacity so that we can be there for the child instead of vice versa. And them needing to be there for us. It's, it's learning the difference between boundaries and emotional coercion, between boundaries and guilting, between boundaries and lecturing, between boundaries and debating, between boundaries and nagging, between boundaries and begging and pleading. Right? That's control versus influence. Controlling is trying to get the child to do it. Influence is saying, here's my best effort. This is the best contribution, the optimal contribution that I can make. Knowing the difference between your needs and your child's needs is a very, very difficult thing. I talked about it today, this idea that we don't even know the difference between love and need. I used to believe that needing was a, was a high form of love, right? It's an entirely different thing. It's, it's almost the opposite. And it's okay to need somebody and to love them, but don't confuse the two. Love is a giving thing. Needing is a taking thing. And so many people express need and, and think they're expressing love. So with your children, you might need something that they don't need. You might need them to work for, through something. You might need forgiveness and they don't need that. Not, not for the same reasons, at least. They need to do it to get clear of you. But they don't need to forgive you for your sake. That's not their need. That's yours. And it's okay. But it's different. Supporting your children where they need to go. Developing a practice of empathy and compassion for your children, especially when it's the, the, the hardest to, to muster. Healthy parenting is its own reward. It creates a better life for you and your family. As I've said, being a healthy parent means being a better mother, father, brother, sister, and friend, a better person. This is the goal of healthy parenting, to be the best parent and human being that you can be. But the measure of it is in your own personal serenity, even when your children continue to struggle. The outcome of healthy parenting is not necessarily well-behaved children, although it tends to have that kind of impact. The outcome of healthy parenting is Clarity, serenity, confidence, flexibility, thoughtfulness. It's, it's, it's your authentic self. And you're understanding the difference between self and other, as Gandhi said. The outcome of healthy parenting is not well-behaved children, but rather peace, serenity, confidence, and clarity, and the possibility of connection. So it's this back and forth thing, right? You can't, one doesn't work without the other. One can't work without the other. One isn't even possible without the other. You can't connect to somebody without a certain sense of self, right? You can't have intimacy without self. You can't have intimacy without other. So, so we talk about the, the, what it means to be a, uh, a parent who provides for their children. And in, and in self, when we think about self, your needs matter. It's okay. The problem is, is that we try when our needs in relationships, see what happens is um, when we have a need and we don't want to own it, we just make the other person wrong, right? We tell them they're being selfish, self-centered, inconsiderate, right? We make them the problem the bad object, if you will. Instead of just saying, this is what I need. It's really hard to talk about that. It's really vulnerable to talk about that. It's very easy to talk about the problems of another person, why they're not meeting our needs. It's very hard to own our own needs. Until you sit in the presence of a, of a compassionate, adequate therapist who sees you, can hear you, and tells you, you, yourself, is okay. It's not right or wrong. It's just okay. It's just what it is. And in, in self, when we think about self and parenting, you take care of yourself directly rather than indirectly. You know, that's really, for those of you who have been in the Al-Anon meeting, that's really what it's about. We were talking about this today at the intensive, that 
codependency, we, we first understand codependency in the context of addiction, most people. We think about it in terms of rescuing, enabling, co-participation with the addict. But codependency has nothing to do with addiction. It's activated by addiction, but it's really a, a lack of a sense of self and a lack of, of healthy attachment or, or intimacy with another. Addiction just highlights it. Addiction just dances with it. But, but it doesn't create it. And, and, and codependency tends to enable it. Tends to prevent its, its cure or recovery, I should say. And tends to trigger or support its continuance. That's the irony of it, of it all. Take care of yourself or your children will feel the burden. Or your children will feel a need to show up, to be a certain way. We do not want your children to stop using drugs so that you feel happy. We do not want your children to stop cutting on themselves so that you are happy. We do not want your children to do well in school so you are proud. We don't want that. Temporarily, we all could probably appreciate the, the relief that those kinds of things would provide. But we want them to do those things because it's a better way of living. It's a powerful, meaningful, rich way of living. And the way that it looks when your children try to take care of you, like I said, it either leads to the loss of self, anxiety and depression, kind of turning it inward, or it leads to rebellion. Either presentation, although they look very different on the outset, are oftentimes evidence of a child who, who feels it's their duty, obligation. They've been handed this message that it's their job to make their parents proud and it's their job to not disappoint their parents. That's why I, I discourage pe parents from talking to their children about being proud of them or being disappointed. It's not their job to impress you. I remember I've shared this before that I had a marital therapist. We actually met as a board, but we hired a person who was a marriage therapist and also a, a business trainer. And he asked all of us, and we were all family therapists, he asked us, what's your job in a marriage? And we all had various answers because we were trained and studied. And he said, what if your job in a marriage was to enjoy your spouse? How well are you doing with that? Shifting the whole responsibility for happiness and joy on us, on each of us individually. What if it was our job to appreciate and enjoy our children? How well are we doing with that? And again, all the compassion in the world, they play the role perfectly. They make it difficult. That's why when you have a child struggling the way that our children struggle, you have to get extra help. Most parents just kind of want to cruise along with the same amount of resources and assets and hope they have enough. Because that other stuff is hard to do, vulnerable to ask for. But you need more. You need more people. You need more education. You need more emotional support. You need a place to vent. You need a place to be seen. I, I ask parents to shift when, when I think about self and parenting from this is what from this is what I need rather than this is for your own good. You're modeling something fantastic. You know what you're doing too? You're modeling something for the children that will inoculate them against peer pressure, against somebody taking away their identity, against them giving it away to somebody rather than being abandoned. So just taking care of yourself. It's a, it's a hard thought experiment, but, but I, I try to think often that if my children past the age of 18, of course, if they need to not be with me to be okay, that I support that. Of course, the irony is, if I love them that much, why would they want to leave that? If they could be their horrible, rotten self, and I was okay with it, you don't want to leave people like that. Those are the people you want to hang out with. Parents hear that they need to ignore their feelings, limits, and needs, right? That's when I talk about capacity, when I talk about back to this previous 
concept about providing for children. When I talk about these things about providing for children, what parents hear or interpret is they need to ignore their, their limits, their feelings, their needs. You just need to own them. But not be right. And most of us want to be right. It's a much less vulnerable place to be, to be right. Parents hear a directive when we talk about understanding that child, right? Well, what about if it makes them uncomfortable? What if I can't hear it? What if it's beyond my limit, my capacity? You can just own it. And, and Alice Miller says in, in the drama of the gifted child, a mother can provide the necessary nurturing for her child, even if she's unable to give it, if she allows the child to get it somewhere else, like evoke, right? I know that some of the things my children need, I can't give them. And that's okay. Being a, a real self in parenting is kind of like my concept in the book, being an idiot parent. You know, that, that when you can own your limitations, when you can own your issues, nobody can use them against you because it's just, it's just real. You're not right, you're just human. Learn to, to, to not be right. Learn to lose. Get good at it. Model being a self, right? Show up in this way and your children start to get a sense. And you know what they do? When a, when a parent shows up with a strong sense of self, the child has to learn to deal with another, right? That's ironic. Many of our parents complain that children are, are self-centered, are unempathic, and sometimes they're not even required to consider an other. When I work with these kids in the field, I show up as a self. I don't try to make the point that I'm right, that I know more than them, I just know myself. And so my boundaries, my limits, my assignments, my feedback, it's kind, it's compassionate, it's respectful, but it's clear and confident because in that context, much easier than in my home, although I practice it here, but my, my work in, in my home lags behind my, my professional work some because that's just a greater challenge. We just show up as a self and the children are like, well, this is different. This feels different. And I think for a lot of us, our empathy robs our boundaries, right? For a lot of us who didn't get listened to, didn't get seen, didn't con get connected to, we, we empathize so much that it compromises us. We think we need to, to give and fix it. It's this exaggerated form, mutation of kind of hearing because we didn't get heard and we don't want that person to not feel heard. So we need to fill holes for them instead of just sitting with them. One of the parents shared a story today in the meeting and talked about this, this idea just having a regular conversation with a child where the child was just heard. They didn't fix it, didn't solve it, didn't justify anything, just heard it. And, and the outcome from the child was subtle but wonderful. And we talked as a group about how hard, how much work went into what seems like a very common sense conversation, but is not so common. It's heroic. The opening, opening passage from The Misery of the Good Child by Jamie Gill. All persons have limits. Consequently, all parents have limits. It is routine for us to discipline or punish our children when they exceed our limits. Unconsciously, our goal in doing this is to get them to behave in ways that we can more easily tolerate and manage. Besides, it makes our load lighter. It is routine in these interactions for us to feel that we are helping the child by our actions. They can't just go around upsetting people. The world, after all, has limits and the child needs to learn about these. This is a way of saying that parents have different bandwidths of what they can and cannot handle. Some parents are extremely rigid and can only manage a little bit breath. Some on the other hand can manage a wide range with seeming ease. From the child's perspective, however, the picture is not so clear. First of all, the child picks up a mixed message. The over the table message is, this is for your own good. The under the table message is, this is my limit, I can't go any farther. That is the parent being incapable. What now? The child is likely to be puzzled, if not frightened. It's okay to have limits, just to own them. Instead, we try to make people fit into our bandwidth and make them the problem. We do that in coupleship. We do that in children. And that's why the, the answer isn't in divorce. 
nor is it in staying together. The answer is in the heroic journey inward, the, the, the journey to find and develop and discover self. And then from there, to be able to provide for other people a, a healthy connection or an opportunity for connection. The last point I'll make about selfless parenting is that if you don't take care of yourself overtly, then you're likely to, to meet, meet your needs in an unhealthy and covert way, such as depression and anxiety. If you're depressed, people are going to take care of you. If you, if you end up getting medication, doctor visits, attention, time, and energy from other people. And so in your attempt to be selfless, you have, in fact, engineered a way for yourself to be taken care of by other people. Your needs will be met one way or the other. They will leak, they will scream, they will awaken like Mr. Hyde if you do not learn how to attend to them. I, I had a student for the first time um, receive this, uh, read, read my book, The Journey of the Royal Parent. I had never read it. I had a child, I had a student read it. And uh, I asked him what he thought. And he said, my first thought is, I wish my parents had read this a long time ago. And he said, if my, he said, if I was a parent, I read this, I wouldn't feel so bad. I wouldn't feel guilty. And I was really, really happy about that. And I said, what did you learn about it as a child? And he said, I learned that I do things for a reason. And I need to figure out what those are. So compassion is a key to self, is a key to, to, to developing self. And we have to experience compassion from others. It's essential that someone find us. It's essential. I received some advice this summer from my son who was struggling with some, some issues some advice from therapists. And at first I was very compromised by it. It didn't feel right. I was trying to be a good client and a good father, but I ignored my truth. I talked to a couple of nationally renowned colleagues that I trust who didn't give me any advice after I sought some local advice, but they said, Brad, you know yourself. You know your child needs help and you know you can take steps. And you've been getting your, your butt kicked in family therapy. And so we, we made some courageous decisions that shifted the equation just a bit to help. Letting children feel, disagree, think a certain way, that's really, really important. And at the same time, standing your ground. It's easy for them to adjust to it when you make it about you instead of about them. This is me. This is my craziness. This is my neurotic self. This is my idiocy. But it's me. This is what I feel. This is my boundary. This is my limit. I'm not right. In fact, I might be wrong. But it's me. I've been thinking a lot about feedback versus boundaries. Right? I've noticed that, that there's some confusion at times with people. I've talked to some of the staff about it. They're giving feedback. Because see, if they give feedback and get somebody else to change, then they don't have to set a boundary. Boundaries do the teaching. Boundaries require demand shifts in other people by their nature. So the, the take home is to own your needs, not to deny them, not to ignore them, but to, to, to own them, to be a self. That's the rule, to be a self, to be yourself. And the task, is to, con to continue to expand as you can, as the situation asks for it. The traps of selfless parenting, it's not an ideal to strive for. It doesn't make sense in so many ways, and we've talked about that. Talking with your children about this is my limit. This is what I'm comfortable with. I can't go any farther. I'm not willing to do that. Versus lecturing them about how you're right, how it's right, how the principle is supported by the University of California, Los Angeles, by the neuroscientist Daniel Siegel, you're not making that argument. You're just saying, this is my limit. No pot smoking in the house. Boundaries aren't necessarily for teaching others, but they do it anyway. They teach anyway. Admit that you might be wrong. It's a really, really effective thing to end 
with a boundary, with a limit, with a decision, with, and I might be wrong. It's my best guess. And I have self-doubt. It's hard to argue that when you say that, because it comes, if it comes authentically, it comes from a deep place of confidence, not a place of insecurity. And lastly, I wrote a blog about this that I've listed here, how, to, how your limitations affect your children on the Evoke Therapy blog site. So if you want to read more about that, you can go there. I'm happy to take any questions that have come in, Alex. Looks like none have. I'll go on to the upcoming events, and then if there are any questions uh, at the end, I'll, I'll take them. We ask all parents to attend six 12-step support groups while their children are with us. Any combination of Al-Anon, CODA or Families Anonymous. Go to the web, Google them, find some meetings in your area. If you live in a, in a fairly metropolitan area, then you're going to have several meetings a day, several choices a day. You can also go to NAMI.org for resources, information, classes that are affordable or free. All of these broadcasts are available on the podcast app on, an, uh, podcast app on an iPhone. Just go to the podcast app and search Evoke Therapy Programs on an Android device. Download the SoundCloud app and search Evoke Therapy Programs or on a computer. Go to soundcloud.com and search Evoke Therapy Programs. On Twitter and Instagram, you can find us at Evoke Therapy. On Facebook, search Evoke Therapy Program. If you want to learn more about the organization of alumni parents that helps people that can't afford treatment, you can go to the Evoke Family Foundation on Facebook and then the Evoke Therapy blog as resources constantly. The Journey After Rogue Parent is available on Amazon. The warehouse is out again, the Amazon warehouse. So just click on other options, other new options, and you can buy it directly there on Amazon from Evoke Therapy Programs. Also audio versions and Kindle versions are available at Amazon, on Amazon. If you, we ask all parents, if possible, to come to a workshop. You can combine this with a visit to your child. Just talk to your therapist. The next one is this weekend, October 13th and 14th. If you haven't booked it and you can make it, please come, but it's probably too late. And then the, the one following that will be in September. We would like you to go to one while your child is with us. If you want to do a deep dive into your own work, a powerful exploration of self in small groups in a safe setting, come to Finding You in Park City, Utah. The next one is October 17th through 21st. And then, of course, Finding You Too, which I'm involved in right now. The next one of those is you have to have been to a Finding You already, but November 25th to 29th, I think there's a spot or two available for that. And then we're going to have alumni intensives for former students. Any student 18 or older can come to the Evoke Summit Lodge in Park City, Utah, and do a four and a half day intensive, this deep dive. Contact intensives at evoketherapy.com for more information or go to our website. Parent support groups, I'll be in Birmingham, Alabama on October 26th. We have one on, in Seattle, Washington, October 24th. Chicago, Illinois, I'll be there Tuesday, November 6th. New York, New York, November 12th. And Philadelphia, November 14th. Pursuit trips are high adventure trips. Think therapy, light, sober fun, family adventure. Any other questions on any topic? Looks like there are none. All right, folks, I'm going to be talking about this is actually based on a blog that my wife wrote called Getting It Right Versus Getting It Real. She wrote this a few years ago. So I'm taking her blog and turning it into a webinar. It's a small aspect of what we talked about tonight, and I'll expand that into a full webinar. That'll be a, uh, next Thursday, October 18th at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. I'm doing once a week during September and October because I'm in the field again. So forgive me for not being able to do two live ones a week. Have a great week, folks. I hope this is a helpful point of contact. Good luck in your work developing self and also expanding yourself, your capacity as a parent without neglecting either one of them, finding balance in that. Both are necessary and one can't rob the other and still be successful. Have a great evening. I'll talk to you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.